And so, as I said, this is the last lecture of this course. And uh, in this lecture, we are going to talk about instance segmentation. And uh, the, the idea will be, we will briefly talk about what this problem is and how this is different from other segmentation problems we have uh, studied so far. We have briefly talked about those, uh, those things earlier as well. And basically like two important topics for today will be, uh, the first will be like uh, how we extend like object detection to instance segmentation. Uh, that's I think very, very interesting uh, way to solve this problem. The second aspect is uh, you, ha you have studied proposals, right? How we can improve proposals. So if you remember like when we were talking about object detection, uh, there were some issues the way the ROI pooling was being performed. There was some loss of information and there was some uh, additional contextual information which was being utilized, which we didn't need. So we'll try to address some of those uh, issues here when we do this uh, instance segmentation. All right, so uh, let, let's start. Uh, now, instance segmentation is different from semantic segmentation, which was the topic of last lecture. And uh, you have seen this image uh, before as well. So given this image, semantic segmentation will be, for each pixel, you have to say which semantic category or which object categories uh, that pixel belongs to, whether it's a table, it's a wall, it's a chair. And it will look something like this, uh, the output uh, result on the right. Okay, so it just says, okay, which semantic category each pixel belongs to. For example, if a red is for chair, you will just mark all the pixels red, which belongs to chair. Similarly, if a pixel belongs to a table, you will just mark all the pixels orange. Now, today we are going to see like instance segmentation and like the high level idea is similar. You have to still say uh, which semantic category each pixel belongs to, but there is one additional task which differentiate, uh, differentiates uh, instance segmentation from semantic segmentation. Here you have to here you, uh, also have to separate different instances of the same category. For example, if you have to do semantic segmentation of chairs, but if you have two different instances of that chair, your algorithm will have to say that, okay, this is chair number one and this is chair number two, and these two are different instances, okay? Other than that, the problem is almost same as semantic segmentation. Now, let's see like what are the different ways which can be used to solve this instance segmentation problem. Now, the result on the center for this image is for semantic segmentation, where blue is for uh, television and this, uh, Pink, pinkish color is for like uh, people and this is for table. So now you can see that even though we need, we have like these fine boundaries, right? Where people are present, but then we don't know like what are the separated, separating boundaries between these two individuals or these two individuals. Okay, so that part was missing in semantic segmentation. So we need uh, instant segmentation where we'll have to separate or create these boundaries as well. Even though these two regions are like the same semantic category, but it still will have to separate those two. Okay, so this uh, output on the right is uh, from instance segmentation. Now, one simple way to solve uh, this problem of instance segmentation could be you can take the image and just do object detection. And object detection gives you this kind of bonding box around each object instance, right? So it will tell you like uh, how many uh, people are present here. It will give you like TV monitor as well and many, many other objects as well. And since your bonding box is surrounding like each individual separately or each, each instance separately, then you can have like some rough idea about which pixels actually belong to which instance. And what you can do is you can kind of use this information to separate two different instances of the same category. All right, so you can draw bonding boxes around here and then you can use maybe some distinction between those two. But again, the challenge will be that foundry is not going to be very, very fine. It is not going to be like this. You'll have to use some kind of heuristics. It might be some straight line, okay? Or you can use maybe some other heuristics like what kind of shape you have in the other regions and maybe some continuity on, on that surface. So it is not going to be uh, perfect like this, but still you will be able to tell like how many different instances are present and some rough boundary of those. Now, we are today go are going to talk about this. Uh, I think this is one of the state of the art algorithms for object detection as well as uh, 
instance segmentation. This is called mask RCNN. And it's based on the same simple solution we discussed here. Okay, it will do object detection. And once it has like these object boundaries, it will try to refine or it will try to draw these finer boundaries for each instance separately. Okay, so it's, it's built on top of uh, all the algorithms which we studied, uh, your RCNN, your faster RCNN, faster RCNN. So it's actually built on top of faster RCNN. And it will try to address some of the issues which we discussed in faster RCNN. And on top of that, it will also give you the segmentation boundaries of each instance, solving instance segmentation. Okay, so these are some of the results from uh, this algorithm. And you can see that it's doing a pretty good job, like in these challenging scenarios as well. Right. So all these boundaries which are drawn here, these are actually output of this algorithm. So in this case, you can see like it can easily distinguish between these three individuals and it has like a fair idea of like where the boundaries lie. Okay. Now let's try to understand how uh, this mass, uh, mass car CNN is extended on top of faster RCNN and what were the challenges which were addressed in this particular model. So faster RCNN, you all know, like you given an image, it will have a RPN which will give you like these kind of proposals. And then you have ROI pooling, which will be applied on top of each proposals to extract these features. And this, these features will be used to do classification and also bonding box regression. So until this point, it's same as your faster RCNN, where, which was completely end-to-end, -end, no external like uh, proposal uh, reduction methods. The proposals were done internally, right? And then you have, so in this case, we have ROI aligned, which we are going to discuss today uh, in, in more detail. Uh, but in faster RCNN, you had like ROI pooling, which will just pull these features into this fixed shape feature map. Okay, and then you can use these features to do classification. You can predict like the bonding box and that will like kind of adjustment to this proposal, like what exactly the ground truth bonding box will look like. Okay, so that part was faster RCN. It will give, it will solve object detection for you. Now, on top of that, what mask RCN does, it takes those features and add like a very small network on top of this. Again, very simple convolution network. And it tries to find this fine boundary of that particular instance. Now, if you think about this, these features are actually corresponding to this individual over here, right? Or this instance over here. And then we have like all the information we need to find these boundaries. We don't need like this contextual information over here. And that's exactly what is being done here. We just take these features. And we just find this boundary and it's solved as like a foreground background problem. Okay, so background, you say the instance is not present and foreground is the instance is present. So it will be just a binary mask, a fine, fine boundary. And that will give you like uh, the segmentation for this instance. And if you do that for all the instances you have or all the proposals you have uh, from this uh, network, then you can find all the instances which are present in this image. And you will also be able to tell which semantic category they belong to because you have this classification head over here. Okay, so this kind of architecture is actually giving you three kinds of outputs. It will give you bonding boxes. So one bonding box will be for one uh, instance of any semantic category. And what category this classification score will tell you. And in addition to that, for each of the bonding box, you will have this refined segmentation boundary as well. And combining all this, you are solving actually object detection, you are kind of solving classification as well at a very fine grained level, and you're also solving instance segmentation. Now, this part is pretty simple because uh, this is just convolution network. You can add like maybe three, four, or maybe a deeper network as well. Just take these features and try to predict this mask. And since you need like ground truth mask as well to solve this problem, what you will do is you will have a ground truth mask for each instance. You'll just compare them pixel by pixel, and you can compute maybe L1 loss, L2 loss, or any other MSC loss, right? Or regression loss, which is fine. So this part is pretty simple. The, the, the interesting aspect is this ROI align. How exactly we will extract like these features from the proposal to get these features so that we can get these fine boundaries. Because you know that 
when we were trying to when we we're trying to extract like these features using ROI pooling, there were issues like we were adding external uh, context, which is not part of this bonding box. And you're also trying to clip like some of the part, which is actually inside this bonding box. So in ROI Align, we will solve those two issues. Okay, so now if you think about this, uh, let's say this is your ground truth bonding box, which is mapped on top of the original image. And let's say your feature map is of size three, four, five cross five, something like this. And if you scale your ground truth bonding box, it might it might lie, uh, lie something like this, right? So it, it won't fit perfectly because this is kind of a discrete uh, feature map, right? So your original image might be 600 cross 600 pixels, but your feature map might be, let's say 50 cross 50 or 60 cross 60. So there is some downsampling happening when you're using the feature encoder. So same downsampling will also be done on the bonding box, which is coming from the ground truth. But when you will try to overlay on, on top of this feature maps, it won't perfectly align here. And that's what we saw last time. Then we'll have to adjust this bonding box uh, to this discrete activation uh, feature activation map. And so if you look at this, so this point, the closest point is this corner, right? So this will go here like this. And again, if you look at this one, the closest point seems like this. So it will go there. And again, same will be done for this and this corner. So basically you will adjust this and it will be mapped to this location, the, the one on the background. So in a way, this is like quantization. And if you again try to map this bonding box on the original image, then what's happening, all these pixels from the original image are actually getting added to this proposal, which is not the right way because this is like additional information, which was not actually present in the ground truth. Okay, so that's like additional information. And this region over here is actually something, the information which we are losing because this is actually part of your bonding box, your ground truth bonding box. But then because of this quantization, we have to shift the bonding box. So we are actually kind of losing this piece of information. Okay, now let's see how we can uh, fix that using ROI align. And this is again, one example, which we also saw when we were talking about faster RCNN. And this is actually giving you a clearer picture, like what kind of information you're losing and what kind of information you are gaining. So if this is your original image and you extract like a feature map of 16 cross 16. So there will be like a lot of downsampling here. And this is your ground truth bonding box, which is the red bonding box here. So again, you will have to perform that quantization. So if you do the adjustments then the green is like something which you are adding and blue is something which you are losing. And if you, could, if you look back into the image, the green region is like this green grass over here. Okay, which lies outside the bonding box. And this blue region is maybe the, the bottom row here, some of these rows of pixels and some part over here. Maybe the ear might be gone or the spur might be gone. Okay, so we are losing something. Now, for detection, that's, that's fine because we are doing some kind of adjustments at the end, right? We, we adjust like how much is the bonding box misaligned with the original ground truth box and that's exactly what we train on and the network might be able to adjust that but if you think about if you have to do the fine segmentation of this object it will be tricky because then we are losing like losing like all this information we don't have that then we will not be able to actually find this boundary at all okay bonding box still will be able to adjust but boundary it's completely lost and that's why it's actually more important to do this fine grained adjustment without losing any information for segmentation as compared to object detection. So now let's see how we can fix the, uh, this issue. And instead of ROI pooling, we have uh, ROI align. Okay, so this was ROI pooling. Again, one sample example, which we have gone through uh, in one of the previous lectures as well, when we were talking about object detection. And all these pixels were actually, we were losing. And this is something which will happen when you do ROI pooling. Now in ROI Align, what we do is we try to actually do some kind of interpolation. And again, if you, rem if you remember like from last lecture where we were talking about a bilinear interpolation, right? Which was actually trying to, so what was the context? Uh, 
Yeah, so bilinear interpolation, if you remember, we use for upsampling, right? When you have to add like additional pixels, you, you have to go from two cross two to four cross four. So what those additional values will be, and we were using interpolation for that. So exactly same formulation. And again, that formulation we have seen in HOG uh, histogram of gradients as well. So we'll try to do, we'll try to utilize the same concept here as well. And we'll try to avoid like a loss of information and adding any extra information in this case. The idea is instead of completely discretizing or quantizing these coordinates to align the bonding box with the feature map we, we have, we, we try to perform interpolation on those values. All right, so let's say if this is your bonding box and you can see that it's not completely aligning with your feature map. Okay, so if we have to get from this to two cross two, what we do is we just draw these grids. In this case, it's two cross two. And again, it provides you flexibility. You can do like two cross two, three cross three, four cross four, whatever you want. Okay, so that's like one flexibility. And later we'll understand like why that's important. So in this case, we are doing two cross two. So we will just divide this feature map into two cross two. We don't care whether this is aligning well with the feature map or not. Okay, so that will give you two cross two. Now, the idea is to get the values for this particular cell, because we need one value for this cell, right? What we'll what we, uh, what we do is we will see like, what are like all the values to which it's actually overlapping. And we will utilize all those feature vectors. Okay. So for example, if you have to do here uh, for this value, so it's trying to get like four different values. And again, these are equidistantly placed in this cell. If you look carefully, okay, you create like, uh, again, a grid on this. And these are like some four equidistant uh, points on this cell. And then what we do is we try to find out like how far this point is from all these four coordinates. Okay, and using those distances, we try to estimate value for this. So it's not just copying over like value from one activation map to get the output, but we see like what, what are the other pixel values or what are the other activation values in the proximity. And depending upon like its position, its distance from all those values, we just use that bilinear interpolation uh, uh, that, that equation to find that value and just use that. So it will be some kind of weighted sum of all those values. All right. Now, so that's fine. So let's look at like this concrete example. And again, this image is let's say 512 cross 512. And you can have any uh, CNN backbone over here. So if you have like a proposal like this, then what you can do is, and again, I think we have seen this example uh, earlier as well. So earlier, what used to happen is you will compute like uh, the X and Y location uh, for these coordinates, right? And then you will quantize those. But now in this case, we can actually take these fractions as well. It doesn't matter. We don't have to make 6.25 equal to six or 9.25 9 equal to nine. We don't have to perform that discretization. We can still keep like 9.25 or 4.53, whatever these fractions are. And again, depending upon like what's the target size, we will create those uh, grids inside this uh, map. And depending, uh, again, we can use just bilinear interpolation and that will figure out whether we have to use these values or not. So in this case, what will happen is if some of the cell is actually not overlapping a lot, we won't use that value. And it may happen that to get like value for one pixel, we might use multiple values in these cells. Right. And if it's like, let's say, just partial, uh, partially overlap, then we won't use like the full value. There will be some weight assigned to that. So less weight will be assigned to that pixel location if it's not completely overlapping. Okay, for example, so that's coming from the same example here. It's just like zoomed in version. And in this case, let's say we are doing three cross three pooling. So the, the values here, 
Yeah, so this is ROI pooling because these values are not considered. But for ROI align, what will happen, you will divide this grid into three cross three. And this is going to be your first shell, first cell. Okay, similarly, you will have eight other cells because if you look at the target, the target is three cross three, right? Yeah, so this is the division. You will just divide this into three cross three cells. And now the goal is to get value for each of these cells, which will which we, we are going to put in this three cross three ROI pooling uh, feature map. Okay, so in this case, it's just showing you like one of the cell. And again, you can compute like the height and width of this cell. It doesn't have to be like a perfect uh, number. It can be fraction. Okay. So then again, we find these equidistant points. Okay, so again, you know the height and width, right? You have uh, all the information here. You can just find like the coordinates, the X, Y coordinates of these values. Because you know coordinate of this corner, you know coordinate of this corner, so all the, these four corners. If you are do, dividing like into a grid, you know the coordinate of this value as well, uh, this corner as well. Similarly, you can find coordinates of all these four points. So each cell, again, you are dividing into like three cross three. And again, you can make it more denser, but it, three cross three was used. And the idea was to have like just four values for each cell. Okay. Now, what you can do is for each point, so now you have four points for each cell, right? So for each point, you will get a value and you will figure out what are the closest four values for this particular target. And you will just compute the distance from those four values and use like this bilinear interpolation equation, which we discussed in the last lecture. So if you look at this first point over here, so if you try to find out what are the, what are the closest four pixels, so you have this pixel over here. Okay, you will just look at the center. You have this pixel over here. It's coming from this cell, then this cell, and this cell. And let's say if the values are like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 1, or 0 0.7, it could be like any number, just fine. Now, all you have to do is just use this equation to find what will be the target value at this location. Because you know the, you actually know the coordinate of this center as well. Similarly, you know the coordinate of all these three centers as well. And you know the coordinate of this point. You can just compute the Euclidean distance between these two. Right? So depending upon how far it is from these four values, you will find this distance and just put it in this equation. And those will be like the weights. And that will give you just one number which will be the value at this location. And similarly, you can find value for all the other locations as well. Okay, so this is the second location. Again, you can see that this is closest to this one, this one, this one, and this one itself. And again, since this is very close to point two, so this value will be like have very high weightage from point two, so it will be very close to point two. And since this is far from these three, it won't have, these three won't have that much weight, but still they will be considered. Okay. Now, once you have that, you, you can just take like either max of those, you can do average of those. So, you know, like different pooling operations, right? So for example, if you just pick max of those four values and that's going to be 0.51, you just put that value at this location. Similarly, you can find values for the other cells as well. Okay, so in this case, what's happening, you are actually not discretizing your uh, pooling operation. You're not losing like any cell values. And also you are not kind of in completely adding these values, right? Because if this point is far away from this location, then this pixel will still be considered, but only partially. The full value is not going to be utilized. So that's the key about uh, ROI pooling, and that's how it tries to avoid like losing information and adding unnecessary information, which at the end helps you in finding like a finer boundary of the object which is present in the, inside this bounding box. Okay, so similarly, you can find like these four four values for all the cells using the same bilinear interpolation equation, and you can take max of those. And that's your output. Uh, 
All right. And again, you know, like it's not just one channel, right? Your feature like is a stack of multiple channels. You will do the same for all the channels and you will get these features. And rest remains the same. You can just use these features for classification, for predicting the bonding boxes. And on top of that, you can have like a segmentation, small network, few layers of convolution, which will give you the segmentation boundary. Okay, so that's the difference like between ROI pooling and ROI align. In this case, the first important point, we are not losing any information. You can see like there is no blue region, right? We are gaining some information, which is the green, but still like it's, it's not that we are completely relying on that. Depending upon how far we, uh, we are from that pixel, we will consider some weight for it, which is perfectly fine because we, we still are, there's some kind of overlap uh, with that, that pixel location, right? So we should consider uh, some information from there, but not completely. In this case, there is no distinction. We just move it, right? And we just assume that, okay, all of the information is actually important, which is not true. So this is ROI pooling on the right. The green one, you can see like additional information. And again, we don't have the distinction between whether this is important or not important. In the first quantization step, we'll lose like this information, which is uh, dark blue. And again, when we try to do pooling, we'll have to get rid of this uh, other blue portion as well, because it doesn't fit like into your target shape. Okay, and all these uh, issues are actually resolved using ROI align. So that was the key actually of this work, uh, which is mask RCNM. This is actually a very good work and it provides you very good results in not just detection, but also instance segmentation. And once you have these set of features, as I said earlier, like the first part is you can just uh, do classification and bonding box regression. This is faster RCNM. You don't have to change that part. And this is the additional branch where you can have like multiple uh, convolution blocks or convolution layers. You can have like whatever kind of architecture you want to predict the boundary for you. In this case, you can see it's giving you 28 cross 28 cross 80. And 80 is like the number of classes. And I think this, uh, Figure I'm showing this is for uh, MS Coco uh, data set, which is used for instance segmentation. And there are 80 different semantic categories there. So what we do is we have one channel for one category. Okay, so 80 categories, 80 different channels, and the spatial resolution is 28 cross 28. All right, so because this is not like, you, you can have multiple instances in that bigger image, right? And each instance might be of varying shape. But whatever that is, we just target that to 28 cross 28. And there are some issues there, and I will, I will talk about that, what those are, but that is what we predict. So the way it works is, because in the ground truth, you know whether this particular proposal is a cat, it's a dog, right, from the ground truth. Now, what will happen is, if your proposal is coming from cat, even though you are predicting 80 different channels, for 79 of those channels, you will just predict like background because nothing is present from those categories, right? And just for the channel for cat, you are going to say that, okay, in this pixel, cat is present. In this pixel, cat is not present. So it will be just a binary uh, a binary problem, whether it's a foreground or background. And since you have like 80 different channels, one channel for each category, you can do this for like multiple, multiple semantic labels. Okay, so that's how the instance uh, segmentation thing works. Now, as I said, the prediction, you can see like this is 28 cross 28 cross 80. And not all objects are like this squared shape. They will have different aspect ratio. So even in this case, depending upon the aspect ratio of, of your object, this bonding boxes will, will differ a lot. So in this case, it's kind of rectangle, rectangular, right? If you have like a person here, which will be a little tall, then your proposal will be like, like that. It will be a vertical rectangle. But eventually we are using ROI align, ROI align to map it to like a fixed size feature map, something like this. So whatever shape we have, it's actually being converted to square. So that's how it's been trained. But eventually you know that what was the shape of your proposal, right? And you also know the shape from this bonding box. And you can just use that aspect ratio or you can actually convert the square shape prediction depending upon that, that aspect ratio to fix like the, the correct, uh, to actually get the correct aspect ratio of your original object. So this is like what your network will show 
because it's 28 cross 28 and it's going to be square and it's saying soft prediction soft prediction because for each pixel we are saying whether this is a foreground or background so it's going to be a number and very rarely I mean, actually not rarely your network will never say one or zero the way it does for classification right it never predicts one or zero even though we are training the network to predict zero and one but it will never do that it will be some fraction between zero and one and that's exactly what will happen in this case as well so you will have values like which are close to zero they will be background you will have values like which are closer to one higher value they will be foreground and that's why it's called soft prediction because it's not like uh, it's not discrete zero and one but we can make make it that we can use some threshold let's say 0 0.5 if we are let's say predicting between zero and one we can say that if the value of the pixel is less than 0 0.5 that goes in the background if the value is bigger than 0.5 that goes in the foreground so that's the first step we uh change that uh okay no so again it doesn't matter like whether you do that first or you resize it first so in this case i'm showing like the first uh thing uh which is being done is you just resize your prediction because you know your uh bonding box right from the the top, top branch which is doing uh, object detection so what you will do is you will just convert this uh, square prediction to this aspect ratio and just resize it and then you will convert your values to either zero or one okay so you, you will convert your soft prediction to hard predictions and that's going to give you like the final boundary even though your network is predicting like this but you can see like it's it's very much close to the ground truth and that you can just use as your instance segmentation output for each instance and of course you can have multiple objects you will have this individual here you will have these uh, people sitting over here right for each of those you will have the bonding boxes and you will do the same steps and these are like some of the results and you can see like these are pretty cool results uh, from mask rcnn and different different scenarios like very different environments this is very crowded even in this case you can separate like these individuals pretty well okay, you have the nice boundaries of course you have bonding boxes um, which says where the person is but you have like these fine, fine boundaries as well which we discussed like are important for some of the uh, applications okay, in this case you can see like all these cars I think they are parked or moving I don't know they might be parked as well right here you can still like separate all those instances they're pretty cool results even the car which is far away right? some other samples again you can see like it doesn't matter what's the scale of your object the the glasses they are pretty small right and the people are pretty big and this is being taken care by the the proposals you have because the network has the capability to predict proposals right so it knows like what's the size of this object because it's actually looking at the image and then estimating okay this could be the size and also the aspect ratio you will have different aspect ratios for bench like it might be a horizontal rectangle for people it might be vertical and again for people like it will vary a lot whether they are sitting whether they are standing so it can address like all these issues aspect ratio issue of scale whether the object is close to the camera or far away from the camera okay and that roi align we discussed that's actually enabling to find these these difficult boundaries here how to separate these instances 